There are three versions of La Belle Dame Sans Merci by John Keats that we know of as uh, close to the period of composition. Two of the versions are very similar and one is somewhat different. There's a version uh, in a letter that Keats was writing uh, towards the end of April 1819 to his brother in America uh, and that version is the one I'm going to use uh, for this talk because it helps to illustrate a couple of features of the poem that I want to draw attention to. Um, so the textual situation is a bit more complicated than you might at first think, which is quite often the case with Keats, actually, who uh, was unusual for a major poet in being quite happy to uh, revise his own work, working with transcriptions of original drafts made by friends and admirers. And he would also often leave, as far as we can see, the punctuation, sometimes even the actual words, um, to uh, those friends and helpers or publishers. But um, there's, there's, there's one particular area of, of uh, contra controversy with the versions of La Belle Dame, which is that it was published first in a journal of the time, The Indicator, in a, in a version somewhat different from the one I'm going to use to talk about here. Um, I'm not persuaded myself that, that the uh, Indicator version has a kind of separate equivalent authority, but that's, that's for another time. So this is the version slightly tidied up I have to say, uh, from from the, the thing itself, but only very slightly. I've kept in the, the cancellations and things. Um, so the manuscript of the letter in question suggests that Keats was either composing straight into the letter, as it were, or more probably was, was transcribing from an original draft, which he was still working on as he copied out the poem, in the letter, and that explains why we see uh, various uh, cancelled words and uh, thoughts that come to him uh, about the rhyme, for example, as you see in the middle stanza uh, there. Um, uh, he, uh, he ends up with that fourth line in the middle stanza of four rhyming with saw, having played around with it a little bit. Um, we know that Keats had an extreme, indeed an extraordinary facility in poetic composition. He seemed to be able to uh, envisage stretches of poetry, including sometimes in quite demanding uh, verse forms, um, all in his head. And he would, because his, even his quite rough drafts form a big contrast, say with someone like Shelley, and that they're quite neat not that much corrected and even where he does try different um, versions of things he's he there's quite a lot of kind of um, sustained writing before he crosses it out and then and then tries it again and so it looks like La Belle Dame Sans Merci is a poem of that sort which Keats uh, sort of had all, all at once in his head and, and then sort of worked through uh, a couple of drafts and then continued to work on it a little bit uh, using transcripts made especially by his friend Brown. So the themes of the poem, to go back to the beginning of it, I'm not going to linger on. Obviously uh, death, Keats's health at the time, starting to feel poorly, um, the turmoil of sex and love, He's got maybe Fanny Braun in mind here, his, his relatively new um, paramour, but there are other women he might have had in mind as well. And uh, there's also a kind of obvious implication in the poem that this is a displaced poem about poetry itself, about the muse as a, a kind of killing responsibility and a, and a tremendous oppressive burden as well as a source of, of pleasure and delight. The poem is also very famously uh, rich in literary resonances and it's very characteristic of Keats throughout his short career uh, 
to build on the conception of a poem by launching from a creative imitation of admired models. Um, but I'm not going to talk about the many literary models either. Neither am I going to dwell on the diction, particularly because uh, in one respect at least it's working fairly obviously. It's uh, There's a as a Spencerian derived a sort of romantic medievalism. You could see why the Pre-Raphaelites like this poem so much. But go, but sort of threaded through the romantic medievalism of the vocabulary, there is also a more generalised evocation through the diction of a, of, a, of a sort of background feeling of desolation and decay and, and not being very well. I'm thinking of words like withered, pale, anguish, fever, moan, strange, wept, wild, starved, horrid. For such a short poem, there's, there's quite a lot of that vocabulary. What I do want to do in this short talk is just concentrate for a few minutes on how uh, the poem gets to achieve its highly distinctive atmosphere so its basic form is obviously ballad-like. Uh, uh, it's headed in the letter version, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, which obviously suggests a Provencal ballad straight away. But it, it, in the transcript by his friend Charles Brown, um, which has been slightly modified, presumably from a, a fair copy with changes by Keats himself, uh, it's actually the title actually has a semi-title um, of ballad, a, a ballad. So they're short stanzas, um, each stanza consisting of, a, of three lines with an eight-syllable count and then a fourth line with a four-syllable count. And, and the rhyme is A, B, C, B. Uh, so not a neat uh, quatrain rhyme, but a, uh, one of the many features of the poem's form, which, which has a slight kind of a restless, unsettled feeling about it. The poem is well organised. There are three introductory uh, stanzas in the voice of the poet, then the next six stanzas take up the night uh, narrative of, of um, meeting with the lady. And then there are two stanzas which uh, relate the dream that he had uh, that once he was enthralled to the lady. And then the final 12th stanza uh, rehearses again the first stanza with, with slight changes. Now the, uh, the eight syllable count uh, for the first three of, it, of, the four, of the four lines of each stanza is remarkably consistent. I think it's uh, the case that every single one of those lines does have eight syllables and the, um, the iambic pulse which uh, underlies uh, the whole poem is also noticeably carefully sustained. So there's a sort of steady deliberateness of movement forward underlying the poem's trance-like air, almost as if the poem's speaker is in a hypnotised state. And that dreamy trance-like quality uh, does have other components, but just to stay with the rhythm itself running across the the formal sort of stipulants of the of the metrical organization for a minute. The fourth line in each stanza varies much more. You get uh, clusters of strong stresses, adjacent strong stresses, as in no birds sing, uh, uh, made sweet moan, and so on. Um, and there are also uh, quite quite numerous variations in the line length there, uh, sort of elided fifth syllables and so on. Uh, and so the overall effect is that as you get to the end of each of the four line stanzas, there's a, a repeated effect of, a, of the dreamy trance troubled by rhythmic counterbeats and adjacent stressed syllables, a, a feeling of disturbed depths, which import a, imports a slightly neurotic insistence to the poem. Um, I'm sure that uh, that Keats was doing this very, very consciously. Uh, so, for example, um, 
when we get to I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all, they cried, La Belle Dame sans merci, thee hath in thrall, it says in the letter. Now that's changed in the brown transcript and in the indicator version to hath thee in thrall, but I think thee hath in thrall is a very strange four-syllable line, almost got four strong stresses in it, and um, so I clearly a, a an effect of a kind of halted steadiness of movement in the final line there, which Keats has worked quite carefully at. The rhythm throughout is also um, complemented by, uh, in the first three lines of each stanza, by very subtle, slight variations uh, in, for instance, where the pauses come within each line. Sometimes they flow very, with a very iambic uh, run, and sometimes they more halting as if there's a, a sense in the poem of a slight effort that's required to maintain its air of, of dreamy abstraction. Now, there are three characters in the enigmatic, enigmatic and inexplicit narrative, uh, which is itself, as a narrative, nested in three layers. There's the speaker of the poem, then there's the night, and then there's the night's dream, and then we're taken back to the beginning, except this time... The, the almost identical stanza at the end as at the beginning is repeated but this time spoken by the knight not the speaker of the poem and that's really interesting I think because none of the three versions that we have of the poem use any punctuation to differentiate the eye of the speaker from the eye of the knight in the narrative and that confuses or blurs their separate identity so that the knight's experience comes across to the reader as a sort of allegory of the poem speaker's situation. Um, in the Brown transcription, there are actually speech marks around um, the, uh, the warning that the warriors and, and princes and, and kings uh, give the uh, the knight in his, in his dream. So I think that the decision not to have speech marks around the knight's part of the poem is is, uh, is really obviously quite deliberated. One other fugitive rhetorical feature which, which has a big role in the way the poem works, I think, is its insistent patternings of, of repetition. Uh, the first and last stanzas are a repetition with the last stanza oddly sort of clinching in tone. And this is why it starts um, at the end, as if, as if to the knight at least his story is an adequate explanation of his condition. But uh, one hardly notices on first readings that um, that there are a lot of repeated words with curiously unobtrusive intent. So the word wild in line 16 and 26 and then twice in line 31, dreamed, line 34 and 35, the way that the word dew, as in fever dew and manner dew, is repeated. The word pale in the first and last stanzas, but also three times repeated in different grammatical forms in stanza 10. Uh, the word death in the, in the letter draft is repeated in the third stanza, although cancelled uh, by Keats. And also in the draft, the word honey is repeated but then cancelled. The phrase cold hillside or cold hillside is repeated. But there's also an effect of, of repetition through recurring grammatical formulae. Uh, the speaker says, I see, and then, then the knight says, I met, I made, I set. The lady's action is recounted in terms of she found, she took, she lulled. And then there there's a kind of Sing song re going over the same ground again with variation of her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. And then there's wither as well, which uh, with which Keats at first begins the last stanza in the letter draft, as we can see here, then cancels it and goes back to sojourn. Finally, it's that conflation of the first person speaker fusing poet with night, which charges the whole poem with a sense of troubled identification 
between uh, the speaker and the knight and previous kings, princes and warriors who've succumbed to the health-draining thraldom of the uh, inscrutable female, the lady with her blend of sensuous attraction and sinister destructive authority. <laughs> 